Self-analysis is hard. Uh, I, I said this before, but this is the basis of growth of the climbing brain. Opinions are how you sequence. It's how your brain allows you to make decisions, how you reach beyond what you think may be possible. And you need to expand your opinions through improving your self-analysis or just your ability to analyze in general. All right, Tim, my dude, how's it going, man? Josh, what's up? We're back. It's you. It's me. No guess. Uh, this is our our. I guess we found a new cadence, right? It's like you and me, a guest. You and me, a guest. And and I like them both for totally different reasons. And I also love getting to do a reflection on our on our past guests. I I feel like that's a, a little uh, segment that's going to stick around. Yeah, I definitely, I, I personally also like the cadence and uh, I had just listened to the podcast you just did with Jamie that was released before the Japan one or no, after it's yeah. released this yeah, after yeah. the Japan one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just listened to it so I could review it a little bit. And I was, it's like, I'm listening to a completely different podcast when I was listening to you guys. I was like, Oh, I got to go on back on my podcast. Like what, what the did hell? You, did you like talk into your <laughs> phone? Kind of Were funny. you like, Oh, Hey Jamie, what about this question? And you're like, Oh, he can't hear me. Damn. <laughs> like accidentally start podcasting. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I did want to like, I, I got antsy. I was like immediately like, oh, I got to say something. Like I got, I got things to say. <laughs> <laughs> you put up your hand. Yeah. Um, well, we, we definitely missed you uh, before we go into the Jamie reflections, because I'm, I'm just glad that you listened to it. And that was a really meaningful podcast for me. And I think it'll be really fun hearing your take on it, having listened to it versus participating. That, that does give you a little bit of a different kind of perspective or point of view. Uh, but I just wanted to like touch on the Jap uh, the I don't know what we call it uh, the best climbing gym in the world podcast where you went to Japan and you know uh, had your thoughts on there because a few things happened since we dropped that pod and you know it was all about like wh why is this climbing gym so good why do they make such good climbers in Japan and then I don't know if you saw but uh, in the latest World Cup I think it was in Italy the the Brixen uh, four out of the six finalists for the men's bouldering were Japanese. <laughs> it's like, you know, like my buddy Ben was like, Hey, by the way, did you see that, uh, the field was stacked with Japanese competitors? I, there weren't any in the women for bouldering finals, but still, uh, I feel like, did, you know, I don't know. Did we, uh, did we somehow, were we responsible for that? Are we ahead of the curve or is it just, was it the gyms, Tim? Is that what did it? Yeah, um, I mean, I I do think that most World Cups, you will see a crazy saturation of Japanese athletes in the field of like their top 20. Any semifinals, you're like, you know, I would be surprised if I didn't see a quarter of the athletes Japanese in any semifinal. And so, but it's funny that it's like kind of immediately after. It seems like the World Cups this season are a bit harder to be consistent in. Uh, that's something that I've noticed um except for like a handful of the athletes like the usual female athletes like yanya brooke natalia seems like hannah mule is like doing really consistent um but in the men's field it hasn't been consistent in the last couple of years but yeah what is consistent is seeing japanese athletes at the top <laughs> but this kid serato and raku he's been he's been in almost every single like top five in every round it seems like it feels like and he's he's a kid he's young yeah uh it just blows me away how there's these big names in Japan. I don't know. Just, just pick. I mean, there, there's a lot of big names, maybe like five just off the top of my head that I could name, but then you'll see finals or semifinals and there'll be someone who you have no idea who it is. And you <laughs> see them and you're like, Oh, this person is incredible. And it must be tough. I mean, actually I, I was going to say it, it's tough to, uh, you know, figure out who the, who the national team is going to be or who's going to be at these world cups for Japan. Cause the, the, the competition is so tight, but my hunch is, is it's like that breeds, uh, more success. Like their, their training camps, or if you walk into B pump and you are Tomoa, you're just going to be instantly climbing with who is some of your biggest competition for the whole year. And so they're just instantly they're, they're basically always training with the best of the best and it's like success we get success is something we've, we've talked about and lucky them yeah i i think the other side of that is also just as important where you're you know you're saying that success begets success you know the higher end getting more elevated the lower end can catch up to that for sure but also at the higher end it's hard to maintain uh consistent pushing it's something that jamie had mentioned also in the podcast 
where like, you know, once you get to a, well, I'm, I'm not going to try to reiterate that, but ba basically the, it's, it's hard to keep pushing. You know, you, you start to kind of, uh, oh, he was saying that about his own performance when he got to hypnotize minds, you know, he was kind of, he had a different mentality when it came to that approach where you should be like a kid, like everything is possible. Of course, everything is possible. I can do everything and I can figure out everything. And that becomes difficult at a high end, right? Because your opinions are more formed. You are pretty sure about more things that are, you know, possible, and less possible. Uh, so that kind of bleeds into your opinions, whether or not that's right or not, you shouldn't think that way, right? Because that's not going to get you to try harder at the next session, right? So, so regardless of if it's true or not, it's not going to get you motivated. And a lot of a lot of athletes that I see at the highest level are like that. But if you have, in my experience, going to momentum is the scariest thing for me. But, and, but I love it because all the kids on the team are insanely strong now. And I'm like, wow, this is the level, the standard of the, you know, the kids 13 to 18 are just insane. But then also like everybody else who is just, just as good as me. And I'm like, wow, like this is kind of ridiculous. And that keeps me like, oh, I got to go back to the gym. I got to keep working on myself. Like, it's just the perspective. Like I can always, like everyone can always get better. And that's something that I think is much, much more prevalent there. Cause I was seeing like, literally this kid, these kids look like five, six, seven years old hopping on these crazy sideways dinos and jumping around the wall. And I'm like, that's something I don't see in America is the kids just like going crazy. Well, if, if that gets you psyched, uh, that little teaser on, on Tim's behind the scenes for Japan, go, go listen to that episode. It's a few weeks past, but it was a, it was a good one. Uh, and I'm just going to jump on that beautiful softball segue you, uh, you handed me there for launching into to Jamie reflections. And, and I didn't have that written down, uh, you reminded me that, yeah, he did that. He, he came to Colorado. He said, what's the hardest boulder in Colorado? And then he just sieged it and it took him years, but just that mentality is just so cool. And then, yeah, it's interesting. Why didn't he do that with hypnotized minds? And he, and he talks about it a little bit and it's funny how we start to close our mind a little bit to what's possible. Uh, and hypnotized minds, uh, if you look at it, it doesn't look that crazy. I don't know. Have you ever seen hypnotized minds? Oh yeah, okay. of course. Like, yeah. Oh, oh not, okay. in person. not in person. In person, like the holds yeah. are there. I, I know they're small, but like, you know, it's really easy road access. Like there's nothing about it that could have inhibited Jamie from just jumping into that. And I just love that self-awareness he had where uh, it, it's like, how do you keep that mentality? Um, and I like what you were saying where you, you see that in younger kids you see younger kids excelling and it informs how, how you feel. And it reminds me of climbing. I don't, you weren't there this day, but me and Max uh, Zolotukin were in Plant Grant, Sunnyvale. I've told the story before, but it's worth repeating for right here. And, and we were feeling our oats. We were strong, man. That was, I mean, maybe we weren't the best climbers. You guys but were there was strong. a time. No, you were super, you guys were super We were definitely strong. feeling good uh, during them. And there was a V12 and uh, we were just working on it. And, uh, Ross, Ross wasn't blowing us out of the water on it, but there was this move and Ross did it no problem. And we were really struggling. I think we may have done the move, but the point was, is Ross just walked up this one specific move. And, you know, this was kind of maybe like 14 year old, 15 year old Ross. He wasn't really, he hadn't really hit his stride yet. Neither had you. But the point was, is it just kind of mess with our minds where we thought like, why is this move so easy for this younger guy? And, uh, you know, I, I don't really have a good answer, but it, I like using that as fuel to propel you to, uh, keep your mind open, to recognize what you're not so good at and to be okay with that. Oh man, that, that feels like another softball segue into our topic for the day, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, dude, I was literally, yeah, I was literally going to say that. Like the, our, I mean, our topic for the day is going to be self, self analysis. We're not going to get into it now, obviously, but, um, you know, my biggest point there is get really good at asking that question. Why, you know, and get really good at answering that question for sure. But first of all, ans you know, asking that question, like, I think a lot of people in your, um, generation that I ran into were more so like, wow, that's just the new generation. And like, you know, I'm just getting old. And you guys did a really good job. Like your whole crew did a good job maintaining that. Like, what are they doing? What are they doing? What are they doing? Like, you know, I always would see someone 10 years older than me at the gym and being like, what did he just do there? Like that just made that so easy. Cause clearly these people were like, you know, anyone older than me that I would climb with, like clearly they were more fluid on the wall. They knew what they were doing a lot better. They were way more confident on the wall. But sometimes as kids just like, you just believe that anything is possible and you just go for it more. Right. Like the thing, the, the biggest problem I had with people who are older than me was just like, you're 
blockage of belief. Like I was like, I never want to lose this as a climber. I never, I never want to grow old in this mindset where I'm like, yeah, I don't just don't think I could do that. And it's like, no, dude, like fuck that. Like, no, that is not the way to think in climbing. We should always be like, I wonder if I can do this. I wonder if this is possible, right? Wonder. We should just always wonder what's there. And like sometimes, and of course I do this, right? Like sometimes we just lose that wonder because we're trying to justify it, rationalize it if, with our opinions. And we're like, no, for sure. You can't do that. It's like, well, dude, I have no idea what I can do or not. Anyway, sorry, that was way too far into our topic. Of the day. <laughs> no, no, but it really does tie into, uh, it really ties into everything, but let's, uh, let's go into the, the whole, uh, reflections on, on Jamie. So, uh, the last podcast, uh, was, it was just me and Jamie, uh, doing, doing a podcast without you, Tim, and we can uh, talk about that. And, uh, we're saying Jamie, it's, it's Jamie Emerson. Uh, and I knew him as quote unquote, the sheriff. Uh, you know, I didn't know much about him other than that. He had a, a popular blog, uh, you know, maybe 10 years ago and he got that moniker, um, as kind of, it was kind of a tongue in cheek joke. It sounded like from Jimmy Webb, who he was really close with when he kind of called Jimmy out for, uh, for, for starting a, a famous V14 in Colorado called Midnight, Midnight Express. Um, one move in and maybe it wasn't a clear start. And look, he's not there to give Jimmy crap on ethics or anything like Jimmy is. Yeah. Jimmy, uh, needs no, uh, forgiveness on that. He is, he has the amazing resume and style to boot. Uh, but you know, that's how I knew Jamie it was just from that tiny little tidbit. And the fun thing about podcasts is getting to hear the whole person, the whole context. And what I really came away from it is just Jamie really cares. He loves climbing. And because of that, he was willing to ask the question, what are we doing? He, he talked about defining a boulder problem. And we had this great discussion with Tristan and we had a great discussion with Jamie. And of course, it's always something that comes up. But I just thought that was such a deep first principle approach is just, what are we doing, you guys? Because let's face it, climbing's arbitrary, you know? Like, I mean, even like, even cool climbing, like Mount Everest, or I, I say cool climbing, like, uh, you know, the climbing history, like climbing Mount Everest and the famous quote from, uh, oh, is it like Moore, like Gregory Moore? I, I could be getting that wrong. Is something like, why did you climb Everest? And he, the quip is because it's there. And, you know, it's like, why did you climb that? you know, piece of rock and start in that one spot and choose the hardest way up. It's like, because it's there. Cause I, cause I want to. And so I just thought that it was so cool that Jamie really cared about what we do and then went down to the absolute meat of it and said, what does it mean? Like what, what or let's talk about, let's set up some, some boundaries so that we're all on the same page. And then we have, then we can discuss grades. And so I just, that really stood out as me as being special and a deep thought from someone who's been doing it for a long time. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I have a bunch of thoughts to share about the, the Jamie podcast and first, you know, first things first, I think is, uh, I didn't know Jamie. I, I didn't know Jamie pretty much at all other than through that name, the sheriff and through some different articles that maybe I'd read and him appearing on, I think it was high and mighty. I think it was high and mighty where he, he shows up and like provide some context for some like, uh, climbing, talking about Daniel and Paul or something. Um, but I didn't know much about him. And that's mostly, I was very busy that day that you guys were podcasting. And I was like, well, I think it's okay to not step on because I really don't know anything about him. So it's going to be hard to like talk about, but man, I loved, I loved listening to it. Actually, I'm not done. I'm going to go and finish the last 20 minutes after this podcast, uh, which is rare for me. If I had, you know, just needed to do it, I would have been like, well, I got the gist of it, but now I'm like, I got to finish this because it's, it's actually really good. Um, but that discussion where, you know, where you ask him, you know, what's the sheriff about? And like, he kind of talks about that and that goes directly into his whole philosophy of, you know, defining what a boulder problem is that gave me chills, like that whole discussion, because I was like, wow, this is the core of, I think, I, I think our generation's a little bit lost in like why we climb and why we grow and like why we push ourselves and why we prove something, you know, why we get, you know, sponsors, yada, yada, like that whole, that whole thing is kind of losing its integrity. I use that word in the Japan podcast as well. Not the Japan podcast, but our last one 
that was me in Japan talking about the bouldering gyms is, you know, the Japanese setters, in my opinion, maintain the integrity of what hard climbing in the gym should be, right? And that's a direct claim. That's a very strong claim to make. And I could not care less if somebody was like, that's the wrong claim or whatever. It's just, that's my opinion. That's, that's my experience of climbing is, you know, something that's taught me climbing, something that's provided me fulfillment in climbing is the challenge of it, right? Is looking at something and I don't care what grade it is, but you know, can I, do I have what it takes to figure out the best way to do it? And could I do it, right? That's for me climbing and climbing outside is very much that maintaining that vision and, you know, bringing up Jared Roth's podcast, I think was really good, you know, of you, Josh, because I think that for me was the saddest part about Jared's story was and more just like feeling for him. I think, you know, we can, we can all move on from that. But like, I just felt for him because I was like, man, if I had found this beautiful move out, out somewhere, and I'd done it first, and people had tried to create, you know, some sort of homage to me, it would be in the name, you know, like cost calling it Ross demand vibrations for a specific reason. And then, you know, loose dreaming appears out of nowhere. And it's like, those have no correlation. I love that you mentioned it. my first thought when you brought up that was wet dream and nocturnal emission. And I was like, this is amazing because all I experience is doing the climbs. And I'm like, why is, why are they, it's like, oh, I get it. You know, it's all related to the first stories. And for me, I'm always, I've always been kind of like a history, you know, nut in climbing. Like I do want to know more and more about history because that's what motivates me and inspires me to like be creative and seek more. But that whole kind of discussion for me was like, well, that's why for me, when I did Spectre for the first time, I had an argument with uh, Ross actually, or just like all, almost all of my friends, because they were like finding, you know, this, um, I think a couple of them had done it with this heel hook way. And Spectre is notorious for this, you know, Dave Graham did it in dosage first ascent long time ago. I watched dosage one a million times and Dave does it this way where he grabs this flat hole in the, in the roof. It's like a very, very overhung wall, maintains this body tension. And the way that he explains it is like, I didn't think that was possible, you know, like holding that tension is so cool. And I'm like, oh my God, I want to hold that tension. It's not so much that I want to get up this rock because it's not me going to this rock and seeing it for the first time. It's seeing Dave do this crazy unlocking of physics and tension and biomechanics and performance and movement that that's what I wanted to replicate. So my friends went, did it a totally different way. And I was like, that's amazing too, but I'm going to do it the Dave's way. And they're like, you could do it the heel hook way. You could just send it right now with this other heel hook way. I was like, I don't want to do that. So I go spend another 300 tries to send it the way that I wanted to do it. And I was way happier with that, you know? And like that, that, for me was never explained until I listened to Jamie's podcast about like why it was so important for me to maintain that because that was the, 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 uh, the original vision. Right. And I wanted to, I wanted to experience what Dave experienced in like 2005, yeah, which you, you just know, or like 2000. What you just said know. right there was, I want to experience what Dave experienced is really meaningful. And it's, I mean, it's, it's why when you're brought up and you see media and videos of, king lines you're like i want to go do that one and uh and it's your it's about sharing that experience and uh, i i think actually it's interesting it makes me think of test piece this this name and it made me think of i was talking to uh talking to nilo uh, about it um one of our coaches and he thought that what makes a test piece a test piece is the history is the story is everything that came before it and it's not just even the first ascension it can be like people you know getting hurt on a high ball it's like oh that guy broke his leg on this thing and it creates this mystique and but i and i remember uh one of the reasons why evolution is you know a big thing for me is because i saw the video like the first my first experience with is seeing the video of jason kell doing it and so you know, it's like, is it the climb? Is it the video? Is it the person? Is it the special move? And it's like, it's all of that wrapped into one. And then, and that's where now we can start talking about a grade, right? Like, and that's also why totally. when, when someone yeah. unlocks a new sequence, it's like, okay, like that doesn't ruin anything. It's not like bad. It's just different and interesting. And it's, there's that like sports center analogy kind of thing. It's like, let's talk about it. Like, is this the same climb? Like, do knee pads make it a different climb? And, and I think that's just fun. And and yeah, I, I I love what you said because it just it it highlights how deep Jamie went. And I thought he really had uh, a, a special approach that resonated with. Sounds like with both of us. Mm -hmm. I mean, I like that the this name, the sheriff. I think 
kind of alludes to this hard ass mentality where it's like you, you know blow the whistle you didn't do it you know it's like i think that is fair to be like hard about when you're because i've i've heard negative things about uh jamie and you know the sheriff title and and i think i would get it too if i was jamie i'd be like yeah, i get it you know like of course i'm being i'm being a sheriff but what he's doing is maintaining the integrity of our experience our experience of rock climbers and why it's meaningful to us and i think that's really really important in the sport that is not defined well in the constructs and you guys go into that you know this like sports center game talk like you know that's what makes climbing a sport that's what makes it something that we can chase and there's nothing wrong with this other so you guys you guys talk about it was you know jamie said this you've said this in the past there's nothing wrong with soul climbing there's nothing wrong with going and having fun doing arbitrary things on the rock it's what we are doing anyway but when we claim things when we claim things that we have done accomplishments that we are you know pursuing the same things that people have pursued in the past it is really important to maintain the integrity of that right if you're going to say i sent the mandala like you got to you got to do what josh did where it's like i didn't do chris's mandala but i did the today's mandala you know like there's a huge difference like we a lot of us know what the Christmas mandala is and it's probably just like a less fun thing to do. So we just redefine it over time, but that's what we know, right? We know that standard. And so sometimes we don't know that and we just claim random things because we see it on the internet or, you know, whatever happens, or we just have different opinions in that moment. And that's still important to have that conversation. So I, I really like, and I appreciate the sheriff mentality where it's like, no, wrong. Well, what's <laughs> hilarious and we're, we're subject to this too is, you know, you can call, you can get, a moniker like the sheriff, but that is just what happens when you care about something and you express your opinion and you just open yourself up to criticism. And we get, we get criticism. I, I know you got some significant criticism around uh, your, your highball link up uh, focus that, that video you did with black diamond. And it's just like, I think, I think like the really deep thing here is that if you aren't willing to set up your metric for success, uh, then you and, and thus open yourself up to criticism. You, you know, like it's like you say, this is how I see the world, and this is what I think is meaningful. And then someone can come along and say, like, well, you're an idiot, you know. But if you don't have the courage to just say, like, this is how I define success, and, and I say courage because if you list out what you define as success, you automatically create. Uh, a definition of failure. You're like, okay, like if I don't do it like this, then it's a failure. And I think that it's easy to poke jabs at people or to give them crap. Uh, but I always love when people take a stand, have an opinion. I, I I'm not in love with with people who just say shit to say shit and just have nothing behind it, and they just are, you know, you know, out there spreading whatever. But uh, even if I don't agree with that person, like I, uh, Jamie said that he's good friends with Carlo and he doesn't agree with everything Carlo says, but, and I don't know if he said this on the podcast, I don't think there's any problem with, with putting this out there, uh, but he respects that Carlo has opinions and, and articulates them and they're out there. And it's just like, that, that's the thing there that I think is so important is uh, I can come up with an argument against Jamie for sure. Uh, and I think knowing Jamie, he would like to hear it and would help him understand why he views things the way he does, or perhaps tweak them. And same thing for me. And so it's just, you know, I just encourage people to care about something and have reasons for caring and then put it out there and be open to criticism. Uh, and I just, I, I, you know, I love that. that. It shows courage. It shows thought and care. And I just uh, appreciate Jamie doing that and then coming on and, and sharing his opinions with us. Yeah, hundred percent. I think that's a really good point. Um, one, one more thing, because uh, you know, this is really just for you guys, it's for me to sell you guys on the Jamie <laughs> podcast <laughs> because you guys are here listening to this one. You know, if you guys had listened to it, um, that that's awesome. But here, you know, just some of my points. But um, the one thing that I got that I wanted to share right now was, and this is pretty relevant to our discussion for today as well, was his observations about really really strong prolific pro climbers like jimmy like dave i mean he spoke a lot about dave graham and and daniel and um the the thing that caught me kind of right away was one of the first discussions about jimmy was and this kind of came up later in talk about dave as well was their ability to sequence and i was like oh my god like i li i heard that and i was like oh wow that is like such a significant skill in climbing it's it's such a 
underrated skill of climbers is the ability to solve problems, right? And like, and, you know, rock climbing outside. And he also mentioned a, a tactic that him and Dave like talked about, which is like, how much effort do you put on your, like, uh, uh, your scouting goes, right? Like when you're really trying to start figuring out a new problem, like how much effort do you put? And they said like about 75%. And Jamie was like, oh, that's how much I put in as well. And I have a very different approach. You know, like for me, my generation is very different. I've grown up competing and like mostly training for comps. So when I go outside, I actually usually do put 100% of effort into all of my attempts, but I put 100% of effort off the wall too. I spent a lot more time before I climb my first attempt I just spend a lot more time using my opinions because I've practiced that over a long period of time. That's what competitions are, right? Is looking at the wall and having the best possible opinions. And I just think that um, my ability to sequence at the farthest stretch is not nearly as good as someone like Jimmy's or Dave's, but my ability to, to have a really good go, you know, that's relative to my knowledge of sequence in the first time I try it is, is probably pretty good. And I'm not going to say better, but like, it's probably pretty good relative to my ability to find the best possible sequence. And I love that thing that Jamie and Dave would go back and forth about, which is like, Jamie would come be like, all right, I'm going to find every possible way that Dave is going to tell me is the way. And then Dave would be like, all right, this is the way, this is the way. <laughs> Jamie's like, what? I didn't see that way. And that's like what me and my friends do all the time. You know, it's like, what's the best possible way? And it's like, I don't ever want to win that game. You know, I don't ever want to win the game of like, all right, guys, this is the best possible way. And it sucks when I do, right? It sucks when all my friends are like, damn, it is the best possible. I'm like, no, no, no. You guys are supposed to like argue with it and like find a better way, you know? And like, maybe it is the best way, but like, that's the fun part of climbing for me. So I just wanted to, you know, reiterate that significance to me is like that. That's like the end of the game for me for climbing is just like sharing the opinions of like deep thoughts about what's possible in climbing. Like, yeah, these are your holds. These are your footholds and this is the wall, right? And this is what you should do, right? And just having strong opinions yeah, about it. You can it. see how impressed Jamie was with Dave Graham and, uh, you know, just thinking through what you're saying, Dave really has probably unlocked more boulders, more sequences than most anyone in the world. That creativity, uh, I mean, you can hand it to all sorts of top climbers. It, it was kind of a thread that he drew between them. So I really liked how you were saying like your generation being brought up more on the comp climbing and trying really hard, but then also trying hard off the wall. That that was a really interesting nuance you just uh, shared there. So that's really cool. And the, the one thing I was hoping that you were going to say, because we talked about just a moment before we clicked record, was uh, this idea that if you were scrolling through a podcast, you may not click to listen to Jamie Emerson because it, it's not a name that you knew as a kind of younger uh, climber. Um, and I just really hope that people, you know, it's like, of course, if you saw Chris Sharma, you're like, I want to hear Chris Sharma or Adam Andre or something. Yeah. Like, you know, those names and Jamie Emerson may not be at the top of the list for you, especially if you're a younger climber, if you're an older climber, actually probably will click that right away. Uh, but just, um, I don't know, maybe I can't say it better than you, but just the idea that listen to that pod. No, you said yeah, it. Listen yeah. to that pod, even if you don't know who he is. You're totally right. I, I, I just like would never have uh, expected to get got you know get what I got from that podcast. So I, in my opinion, it's going to be one of the more underrated podcasts ever on our you know entire thing. Just because it's very hard to understand exactly the discussion that goes you know in I think Jamie's head and your head. And and to be fair, I think you know Josh like that is a conversation in my opinion that spoke more to your philosophies and like your experience over your lifetime of climbing more than most of what we talk about. So it allowed you to express your opinions, I think like a lot better. So, and that was my feedback for Josh, you know, a part of my feedback for Josh, you know, before we started as well. And I think that for me allowed me to enjoy, enjoy the podcast episode a lot more than I've enjoyed podcasts in the past. And I don't listen to that many podcasts. I just like doing the podcast, but uh, yeah, super underrated. Uh, in my opinion, like you, you would never expect to, to get what you would get. I think just from like, I think because of what you were saying about this, like media clickbait thing where it's like not clickbait necessarily, but it's like, he's not Chris Sharma. He's not Adam Andre, but like he is Jamie Emerson, the sheriff. And like, that is more significant than you might think. Like that is, that's an awesome discussion. You should definitely listen to it. Period. If you're a rock climber. <laughs> uh, but we missed you, Tim. Uh, and, and to Jamie's credit, it's, like I, I kind of instantly clicked with Jamie when we did our, our meet and greet. Um, but, uh, I love that he was 
I don't want to say disappointed or upset that that you weren't there, but just I love that that openness yeah, yeah. that he was like, yeah, but Tim is the younger generation, like that. You know, he wanted to to hear your your thoughts. Well, you just gave some thoughts, and and uh, maybe we'll have uh, Jamie back on uh, in the future. Part, part two. two. I'm calling you out, Jamie. Let's go for part two. <laughs> yeah, that was a good. <laughs> Let's go with a part one that good. Part two has to follow at some point. Um, yes. Okay, man. Uh, Let's let's move on to uh, announcements. Um, it's kind of gonna be a rehash of what we did a few weeks ago. The big thing is is that uh, we're launching Patreon uh, in July, and the yeah you know, we have a few different tiers, but the really cool one is just this direct to us Zoom meeting where honestly it's basically going to be a live podcast where we go in deeper onto a topic that we've done before. Uh, but the difference is, is that I say live podcast because you're there and you can interrupt us at any point, ask specific questions about, you know, your own, uh, your own life and how it applies to you. Uh, and even though it's going to be a quote unquote live podcast, the big difference is it's not going to be released to the public. It's only going to be for the Patreon supporters. Uh, so, you know, dive into, or actually I should say the website is patreon.com forward slash test piece. So uh, check out the tiers there and definitely pick the one where we get to meet you uh, on Zoom and, and go deep. And there'll be some other things like we've got some shirts in the work for subscribers. There's going to be some discount codes coming, but really uh, the, the part we're psyched about is getting to interact with you all more directly. Uh, anything you want to say about Patreon, uh, Tim? Any, any psych? Yeah. I mean, I think the the big thing here is that po- you know Josh and I obviously love podcasting and we this is you know episode fifty two I think yeah, this yeah. episode will be fifty two I don't know we're in the fifty <laughs> episode I mean we every time we say that we're like wow <laughs> I cannot believe we podcasted so much uh, so to get this clear we we love it and we we do it for free already uh, but Patreon is just a way for us to level up even further and to for you guys to support us and to interact with us a little bit more so that we can just, I don't know, be more tied to the community when it comes to these discussions, because that's what it's for is to like share our thoughts for you guys. So yeah, I just wanted to reiterate, we're not, we're not trying to just make a bunch of money off of it. We are definitely trying to just level up the game and, um, and just contribute. Yeah, more. I, I mean, the truth is, is that we have a million and one ideas and many things we'd like to do with test piece that go beyond just dropping a podcast every week. But it's just, it's tough to find the time and, and we are trying to bring on more help, but, uh, you know, me and Tim do this more as a labor of love, but when we bring in help, you know, we have to, to pay them. So your support is appreciated and we promise it will, uh, you know, bear even more fun and fruit. Uh, and so check us out on Patreon and while you're there, uh, sign up for our newsletter, uh, or, you know, gives you instant access to some of the pro tips that we have over the week, lets you know when we have new guests coming. Uh, and also, we talked about this last time, There, you can leave us a voicemail on our new website, uh, podcast.testpiececlimbing.com. And I don't know, I we haven't gotten one yet. I really want one. We actually got an email from uh, a longtime listener, Brandon, who kind of went into some of the the black tape stuff. And, and we'll, we should talk about it because oh, we totally yeah. forgot. But Brandon, I wish you would have like left us a little voicemail. Just click on that link. It just, I don't know why. Like, I just think it would be cool. It's some little feature. Uh, Josh wants a voicemail, want a guys. Voicemail. Well, because we could even play it on air. We could like, instead of just trying to summarize what Brandon said, we could, he could be here with us in a voicemail. Um, yeah. Do, should we go? Okay. Let's talk about the voicemail or sorry. Let's talk about what Brandon said, because we meant to bring it up. We talked a little bit about black tapes in Japan. And we didn't know anything about black tapes in the sense of its relationship to martial arts. And he kind of, but you said, you said that you, you I wonder, wonder yeah, if, yeah. Yeah. I actually, yeah, you wonder if it correlates it's, to, it still may not. So, uh, but he had just kind of this cool little, uh, point about, uh, what a black belt is. And the two main things is that it demonstrates mastery and the ability to instruct, a, a, a lower level, um, athlete. And he was quick to point out that black belt did not mean mastery in the sense of you were the best in the world. It just kind of showcased, it was this idea that there is an element of mastery being connected with your ability to instruct. And he likened it to maybe a V7 uh, and that there's multiple degrees of black belts. But I just thought that was 
there was something really cool there where this idea of that word mastery, right? And you talked about how the black tapes were so freaking difficult, maybe impossible and connecting that. And then also connecting the ability to instruct, I thought was just a cool little thing that really, I don't know, hit home for what we do. Yeah, actually on that note, what do you think, uh, what do you think grade in climbing classifies as a black belt? Ooh. In, in those definitions of now you mastery, you have mastery and you have the ability to instruct it. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Um, it's so tricky because climbing is so diverse and you, I can imagine someone climbing V10 and just being, you know, finding their V10 that they can, you know, climb with their this crazy the answer, strong, this is the best answer it could be. you know, can't use their feet, don't know what they're doing on the wall, have no ability to self-analyze what's going wrong and thus no ability to articulate how they could get better and share that with others. Um, and so I think what I'd like to see is more like you can climb, you know, V7 is fine, uh, but it'd be nice to be saying something along the lines of a V7 slab, uh, a V7 overhang, a V7 indoors, a V7 outdoors on you know, granite and sandstone and a, well, I don't know what it would be like, and a 12C, you know, like something like that, like where uh, you kind of have to showcase your ability at a certain level through all of these different um, mode modalities that we associate with quote unquote climbing. Um, and then you can instruct a, a bit because all of those times you went to a new area, you had to bang your head against the wall and, and realize, oh, I'm not a V7 climber yet. This is this is uh, Black nice. Slabbath in Squamish, which is a heinous V set. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know. I love this answer. I I do think like to reiterate your answer though. I I think uh, a lot of people want to get to V ten and climbing, right? Like people. I know so many people are like, I'm going for V ten. Like that's my end all be all. I'm gonna be a master when I get to V ten. And I just remember climbing V ten for the first time, being like, damn, I still suck. Like not not like that, you know. But I was like, I have so much to grow. Like I have no idea what I'm talking about in climbing. Like you know. And so that's for me. Like I still understand that same concept where it's like, well, if you you can climb V ten and still not know very much about climbing and like not instruct it because like not even so much just because it was for you, just because like performance isn't necessarily uh, exactly in line with what you know. And so when it comes to instruction, I think mastery is like much more of a definition. And for me, mastery revolves a little bit more, like my thoughts on like uh, what a black belt, like samurai would be if he was like 60 years old, could still pick up the sword and like kill anybody. And like, no matter what, because he just knows the technique, he knows the, he knows the interaction with it. And like, and I know a lot of climbers who were like, could be off the couch after a year and like get up a V10, you know, because they understand so much about like what relates to what in climbing and like, and what their strength means and their endurance means on the wall. And how do they respond to that? I think that's a much deeper way of looking at it. And so what I look for is like kind of frequency and consistency more so like if you can climb, you know, if I gave you like 10 V7s in a row that were like all different, then you would more likely do them sooner than later uh, versus like you know, could you figure out how to do this V10? That's just like your, you know, your ability to solve, but your ability to execute over time for me, that's what mastery really is. Uh, and the frequency of it. So for me, it's like, I would rather see a, uh, like a, a progression sheet of these 10 V7s probably. I think V7 is a great grade to look at. And then how many times did you fall and for what reasons? And how many times did you flash or send for what reasons? And then that for me would be a much more comfortable sheet than one V10. I feel like cent. this is an argument for circuit grading, right? Where it's kind of like do all mm. of the blue climbs and there's a varying grade range in there. And, and clearly because it encompasses all of the gym, um, you know, it encompasses slabs and overhangs and slopers and crimpers and um, I don't know. Interesting. Uh, but yeah, yeah, thanks for, thanks for sharing that Brandon um, next time. Leave us a voicemail. Uh, <laughs> um, all right. Well, uh, our main topic today is we're going to say self-analysis. Um, and it's kind of how to perform self-analysis. And uh, I'm going to start off with a pro tip that I happen to put in my little like, oh, my pro tip section. What's it going to be today? And then after I did it, I realized that it really does connect with uh, this topic today. And it's this idea that Sometimes you find something that when you get better at, 
it really levels up your climbing. And uh, gosh, I'm, I'm saying this weirdly. Let me just use an example. I, actually, I'm going to use Carlo's example. It kind of came from uh, Carlo. Carlo said something along the lines of, when he climbs in Yosemite, when, he, when he's climbing well in Yosemite, it means he can go anywhere in the world and climb well. And I will say that that is a feature probably uh, of Yosemite, but also probably speaks to something about Carlo and what he, I don't want to say is lacking. I mean, maybe is lacking in that Yosemite and climbing there seems to help him level up everything in his climbing. And I had this experience where I went to, to Squamish and it was hot and I sucked and I was disappointed and I did not climb uh, very hard. Uh, I think I did like one double digit uh, and when uh, that was embarrassing for me. And I thought that, I don't know, I, I didn't know what to think. I just was disappointed. I had a blast though. Squamish is like one of the most fun places to climb at. And I came back and I went in the gym and I was so strong in the gym. And when I, and I it really set me up for a good fall season. Uh, and it just blew me away that I had climbed in Squamish I had climbed a lot on V6 to V9 and struggled, uh, and it somehow unlocked something in me. And it's it, it's something that's happened again and again, where oftentimes climbing on a specific type of really technical outdoor climbing, for me, really levels up my climbing. And some people have this opposite experience where they go and they climb outside and they come back in the gym and they think, oh, I'm so weak. And so there's a hint there that when you do your self-analysis, uh, that says something about your abilities that climbing outside on Squamish did not uh, help you out in the gym, where for me, the gym is something I already kind of excelled at and climbing in Squamish on easier grades actually helped me in the gym. So finding those things that just, you know, when you put effort into levels everything up uh, is really important and uh, lean into them, right? Find them and lean into them. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I, I'm not going to go too deep into that because I think that is a lot of what our discussion is, or it'll, it'll like be picked apart. Uh, but you're talking about that calibration from you know your perspectives essentially, and like, yeah, I mean, if you if you bring any first week rock climber to Squamish or Yosemite or like a couple specific areas, you know, outdoors like Fontainebleau or something, like they're just not going to have the same opinions for the rest of their climbing life, you know, or for the next couple weeks of their climbing life, at least than if you just started in the gym. Right. And like, why is that? Because you're calibrated off of your uh, response and reactions to the wall. Right. And like, if you climb in the gym, you have colors, you have extremely easy sequences to read relative to outside. Right. Like it's easy to see the physics possible on, you know, this side pole to those feet, because also the setters do a really good job of telling you exactly what you probably should do. Right. Like seriously, sequencing inside, inside and outside are completely different things and require different approaches and perspective. But if you start there, you're calibrated differently, right? And if you go from one place to another, you're calibrated differently. You have to catch up to that. But if you do a good job of calibrating in that one area, it probably calibrates you much, much better for another area. And I oft often found that if I needed to perform really well, I would go to Bishop. I would do the same thing where I would go to Bishop and be like, all right, I'm going to try super hard to pay attention here and like really lean into it, be aware and like ask why over and over again. And I go anywhere and be so much easier. Every hold would be better. Like every foot would be easier to trust. Like everything, you know, every mechanic that I had tried to practice in Bishop. And if I had succeeded on it in Bishop and I usually wouldn't leave until I was, you know, successful on something or I would like really try to find that and I'd go to another area and it'd be just a lot easier because I'm calibrated. So I think it's just like not so much to use that in terms of like, all right, now I need to rely on going to Bishop all the time if I want to perform better, but just like pay attention to like why that, why did that calibrate you you know, for the other thing, maybe I should just pay attention to that more often when I'm in the gym and not take it for granted in terms of like this being related to my performance. Uh, but I still think it's super interesting. I know, I said. know we, I mean, it's still, it is on topic. I, I don't want to go too deep, but it just, I, I like what you're saying there where you, you're basically telling me like, Josh, that that's great, but you got to go a layer deeper. You can't just go Squamish all the time, right? Like, and one thing about Squamish, was that the the temps were really bad and so it felt really slippery and greasy to me and something i've always noticed about myself is that i like colder temps and it's because the holds feel better and basically allows me to use more strength and less technique right like less body position because i can trust the friction more and so it just i just think it's important that i you know i i explain uh what i heard there where it was like 
yeah, look at why you're failing, John, or not, sorry, look at what you're gaining from that experience, not so much where you're gaining it. So I just thought that was important to, to peel exactly. that, that layer off. Yeah. Yeah. And just to tweak that a little bit, you know, it, you, you totally can go to Squamish. It's not a bad spot, that dude. seriously yeah. what helps you, you probably should go, you know, or wherever it is, like, you know, Yosemite, Fontainebleau, like I have a feeling that these areas are really good teachers for people. For re- Rifle, Rifle is a great place to learn how to sport climb better because it's hard there, right? And like, you totally can, and you probably should, if if those places are good teachers, but you should pe- peel back the layer. Because if you just do it and you're performing on it well all the time and you don't have that awareness, you don't have that control over time, right? So that for me, it's it's just, you know, you totally can do that and you totally can never think about this and you probably will be successful in what you do. But if you want that layer of mastery and you want that level of control, you probably should pay attention to what you're gaining from all these other sources. And when I go to training camps, like when I was a kid as a teenager, I, I couldn't afford that many training camps. They're very, very, very expensive. And like I would go to, may, I've gone to maybe two or three. And every time I would go, I would get to work with like five or six different coaches, which was awesome for a couple of days with other athletes that were, you know, a strong ability and my mis- my biggest mistake would have been to just go consume the thing and like have fun and then leave right so i tried really hard i was like i only get one of these maybe every other year just because they're expensive and they're like you know it's hard to justify uh doing that but then when i go i'm just like what question can i ask what can i think about and what can i take from here to the next place so that it wasn't a waste of my money you know so my point there was don't take it for granted right like don't go to squamish use that experience and then use it to fuel your next thing. Don't take that for granted. You learned something and your body felt something there. So you should pay attention to what you have, whatever you learned that provides control and better perspectives, better opinions. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, I have a pro right, tip. You, um, also uh, totally different gear, but same, you know, same idea here. Um, my pro tip is ask your friends slash people you're seshing with for their opinions on your movements and efforts. I think this is, by the way, really hard to do uh, for our ego, for our pride. It's also really hard to ask and then listen properly. That's like a really, really hard one to do uh, because we'll often get an answer that we don't like or an answer that we don't agree with. And that's not the point. The point is to get that answer, try it, and just stretch your perspectives, right? And uh, and then navigate what's relevant to you or not. <laughs> that's the, the second point of my pro tip. Because I think, you know, sometimes people will tell you things that are just total BS, but it, it's still worth like taking it into account, seeing where they're coming from and then trying it. More so, I had gotten so much trouble with this with my coach, uh, Justin Cubbage, who was someone I worked with for, you know, a few years in the Bay Area. And he was an amazing coach for me. But I had a really hard time because in our sessions, he would be like, Tim, try this. And I Im- immediately often would be like, Justin, that's stupid. Like, that's not the right way to do this boulder. Like, you should just do this. And he would be like, why are you? Why are you I, mean, I would argue with him for hours. Like, at least we would work usually from like 10 to 4 p.m uh because i wasn't going to school we go from like 10 to 4 p.m like four or five days a week he was madman for me he was he was great but probably two hours of probably three or four maybe he would say more but three or four hours of the week we would be arguing about like why it was relevant to even try something on the wall when i could have probably just tried it and then told him like hey you should tweak this right so just you know a heads up for if you guys are like me and you like challenge you know what your friends say just like try it and and then give your opinion afterwards also yeah i i love that uh because i i think it it shows a way to make climbing, what's the word here? Like, I'm not friendly, or it's almost like a team sport. Like something I love about climbing and going yeah, out. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I mean, I've done some really meaningful solo sessions, uh, especially outdoors, but it's fun to, uh, I don't want to say attack a boulder. It's fun to to just be together sessioning and talking to each other and don't be a, a friend who doesn't say anything. Like have the courage to... To, to say like, I, I think that you're, you know, doing it whack. Like you're not trying the heel hook or you're not actually like committing to this beta. And, uh, you know, I'm definitely one to speak up and, and give, I don't want to say beta, but give feedback. And, you know, we had a whole uh, podcast on how to approach that situation. And really what it comes down to is actually caring about your friend's success. And if you come from a good place, uh, then it will be well received, but I encourage people to be willing to give feedback, be, be willing to, uh, yeah, yeah actually, go ahead. yeah. What, what you're saying there is just as important because I'm saying, you know, ask for feedback, but giving feedback also takes a ton of skill. And you know, what you're saying, you were saying some things like, yeah, like trust is heal or like do some more. If you're going to give feedback here's a secondary pro tip for you. If you're going to give feedback, give feedback in a way that this person can control, right? Don't just say like, 
yeah, just try harder. Like try harder how, with what? Like, what am I committing to? What am I not committing to? I think the ability to give feedback from a place that this person can then tweak something is much, much better. So for me, like, I don't trust very many people to give me feedback. But, and so, you know, find people, you're not going to trust everybody. So, but there are people that you're going to trust in terms of like, every time they give you something, it is something that can get you to try something harder or better, commit better. And for me, that person is Danny. Danny is my absolute favorite person to train with because he's always thinking a little bit deeper about things. He's like my Dave Graham. And uh, that that's some, someone you need in your sessions, someone you trust to be like, all right, what should I do? What am I doing wrong? And they're like, well, I think you're doing this, right? So that comes from a place where we can, if that comes from a place where we can actually control, then we can get better. Danny's the the guy behind the guy. He's, he's the, uh, dude, <laughs> really strong lately, by the way. I, I don't really know Danny well, but I just I just oh, follow yeah. him on the on the internet and uh, just yeah, Danny, you've been leveling up, looking really strong, dude. We yeah, love Danny for your psyched to see what you do over the next couple of years. Um, I forgot. Oh yeah, I was gonna tell you, Tim. I I literally have given the beta that you just need to try harder because I I do see it sometimes where people like uh, <laughs> it's like they're like ah oh, you know what do I need to do here? I'm like hold the fucking swing dude like you, you can do it like i, I see yeah. you trying but like there's no secret here yeah like maybe well it's also like maybe yeah. there's a little more technique but it's like what you actually need to do sometimes it is just try harder <laughs> uh no i do agree with I, I do agree with like a lot of the time people aren't trying as hard as they should but you know for me i choose to not pick that as a lowest hanging fruit. The lowest hanging fruit is often like our choices, right? And then if if we have control over our choices, it's actually just much easier to add effort into those choices because if people don't understand what they're doing, and this is a huge point that I make later, uh, if people don't understand what they're doing, it's hard to add effort into those things. So often like if people just say like, yeah, just try harder through that, people will try harder. And then often it won't amount to anything that provides more success. So for me, like, even though that is a very, very important step to remind people of, it's it's, it's important to add some foundation to that, right? It's like, all right, try harder also, yeah. but like think about well, these things because it'll help And there's you. some salties to that uh, quote unquote, try harder. And mm -hmm. I'm, I remember you you uh, patted me on the back by saying that what people like from the pro tips that I gave was that using your thumb. And that is an element of like trying harder in a specific way. So maybe it's not the best generic thing to say, just, hey bro, just try harder. Um, yeah, and so I'm going to use that to, to say, uh, our main topic today, as we hinted at like eight times, um, is self-analysis. And uh, Tim, I actually kind of... Actually, can I, can I correct sure. that really quick? Because we, we talked about self-analysis as a fundamental tool in your climbing development, right? That self-analysis is, in my opinion, how you grow in climbing, right? In, in, in other than the physical realm, in our thought process, self-analysis is how we grow in climbing. It's a fundamental tool in climbing, Tim, in my opinion. You interrupted me, and what I was going to say was, Tim, why is this important? <laughs> I was <gonna> like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, Sorry. <laughs> well, I, no, no, I, I, I love it. Uh, it's, it's, it's because it when we started chatting about this before when we were going over ideas, it just was like, oh, dude, this is like this is the like the skill in, in some ways. It's like, and I don't know uh, how into this part you want to go, but you kind of did, you did share that some of your frustrations in coaching is that if people haven't even begun to develop this skill, it's almost like they, they haven't even really started. God, I don't want to say this in a mean way. They're almost not ready for coaching in a way. It's like, well, I don't know. Actually, what we're here to do is to help people develop that skill uh, because it will take you, it's, it's the skill that will take you forever, uh, it, or it will take you, it will be there with you on the journey forever. Uh, and I think Tim expressed some unhappiness that like, this is something that he wants to see athletes develop earlier and earlier so that he's not having to drill these basics when, uh, you know, time could be better spent on some of the nuances of, of each person. So is that why it's important Tim? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you're, you're kind of you're kind of nailing it pretty good, but I, I will reiterate. I, I think um, fundamentals in climbing aren't fully understood. You can ask a lot of different professional climbers, like, hey, "What are the fundamentals of climbing? What are the three key fundamentals of climbing?" And everyone's going to tell you something different. And my experience from coaching is that I want to, you know, my goal in coaching isn't to provide the science or the training plan for you to like level up your physical capabilities, my, my goal in coaching, and you know, anyone who's ever worked with me knows this is to get you to perform better, right? And 
how do you get to perform better? That's a really hard question to answer, but that's my job. That's what I've been studying and trying and, and you know experimenting on for the last seven years in coaching, but the last 11 years of my climbing is how to perform better. And so when I come from a place of, you know, all right, let's get to perform better. I kind of require you to understand how to perform like at a flat line. And that requires a lot of good fundamentals because then we can have analysis, right? And if I have to teach you how to, you know, analyze first, it just like takes away a lot of time. And this is something that I believe, yeah, the vast majority of climbers can walk into most climbing gyms, try a couple of things, read a couple of things, and then they're already well-versed in this. And that's why we're podcasting on it because we can just provide a two hour conversation. Well, something that I found interesting when we started talking about this is the, I I think I do self-analysis and I've been doing it and I have developed it but I've done it in my own way. And it was fun sharing my experiences with you on, uh, and I think we'll go into this. uh, I was on a climb called a steep climb named desire, which is a a pretty famous 13 D or 14 a up on Donner summit. And I, I got on it for the first time ever a few days ago, uh, and really focused on what was, you know, the boulder problem, the, the crux, which is kind of after the, the chains of the, the first part, which is a 13 a called warp factor. And I shared with you kind of how I did my self analysis. And it was, I would say it was, it wasn't wrong. It was just different from your approach and, and some of your like techniques and tactics that maybe you uh, teach your, uh, your athletes. And I thought that was really cool. So I'm bringing this up because my point is, is that I still have a lot to gain uh, from it, even though I've been you know doing it for 30 years and, you know, hearing different ways uh, really you know, it, it, it enforces the things that I do right. But, uh, this is that whole theme of like open mind, different generation, not even just different generation, just like anytime you think you have it dialed, just a different, I mean, yeah, it's just like, you don't have it dialed. Like you always have something to learn from, from everyone, usually from everyone. So yeah, where should we start Tim? What, What do you think? I, I, I wrote this, uh, I had like three major points. Um, but my first major point is that self-analysis is hard. Uh, self-analysis, you know, if if it came really easily, I don't think it would be um, like I, maybe that's why we kind of overstep in. Almost everybody oversteps it, except the climbers who kind of instantly like. You know, I notice there's like a couple different tracks of rock climbers that I see. You know, there's a lot of climbers who you know just try it and like do their sessions and you know use it as a workout and whatever and like. And then there's like the other side of climbers who just get it and like improve literally every single day. And in my opinion, the the difference between those two things are the self-analysis and just the understanding of biomechanics and climbing, the physics, the, and then asking the questions, uh, which is my second point, which is ask why, but, um, self-analysis is hard. Uh, I, I said this before, but this is the basis of growth of the climbing brain. Opinions are how you sequence. It's how your brain allows you to make decisions, how you reach beyond what you think may be possible. And you need to expand your opinions through improving your self-analysis or just your ability to analyze in general. And yeah, just to, just to reiterate that, I think what I notice in climbers is they're like, here's here's another point. Um, I think it's much better to be opinionated and wrong and then figure out why you should adjust that versus listening and reacting or responding to that and just doing and not having an opinion about it. Why? Because in the end, you're going to make choices off of your opinions. And if you can expand your opinions and grow that base, you're always going to make choices, right? And Josh kind of always says this thing where like, you must go to do, like if, you know, if I go out to session, I'm going to go and do it. I think that's because your opinions lie in that you can do them. And you're usually used to like committing with conviction that you end up going to climbs and you, you step on a foot to send and you grab a hold to send. Right. And, but that's based off your opinions, right? That's based off of your opinions and your ability to self-analyze and just analyze in general. So yeah, that's kind of Uh, where I wanted to start. (laughs) Very cool. Uh, what you just said there, it's better to have bad opinions. Uh, can you say that again? It's better to have bad (laughs) opinions. This is actually my last point. Um, it's better to have an opinion and be wrong Mm, about you know, like in the end, this was not the best way to do it. But if you're like, this is the way, you know, so the reason that's, why it's be- I, that's better. The reason why I, I latched onto that is it made me think of uh, Adam Andro talking about onsighting and how it's risky and how it, it's sorry, I, I, it's risky. What, what I mean by how it's risky is that he looks at the route and then he's climbing and he says, I'm going to grab this hold with my right hand. I'm going to put my foot up here and stand up. 
But what if it was a left hand hold? And it's like he committed to the right hand. And then sometimes that's wrong, but it's that ability to just have a opinion and to pursue it that really does get you up the wall. And so the the self-analysis uh, is, it, it's not exactly in that moment. It It's, you need to have an opinion, go after it. But then you, you said this, uh, you said that the ultimate goal is to get good at asking and answering the question, why did I fall? So uh, I just, I, I want to frame everything around you have to have an opinion and move forward. But but then when we're talking about self-analysis, it kind of starts with this. I mean, actually, it, it doesn't always happen when you fall, and I'll use my my example. Uh, but I just thought that was really important to set up that, that framing that you said that really what it comes down to is being able to answer that question, why did I fall, and then have an answer for it. And boy, do I see that lacking uh, in everyone don't even, they don't even think about why they fell. It's just like you come off and you actually, sorry, I keep, uh, I keep going on this, but you actually said something to me that, that really stuck in my head when you talked about coaching, you said that when someone falls off, I'm I'm just going to butcher this because it's been a long time, but that you don't instantly attack them, telling them like you, it's, you know, you, you're, you did this wrong or whatever. You just kind of give them a moment let them, you know, kind of collect. Well, I say what happened. Yeah. But, but don't you, you also say like, I, I think yeah. maybe it's important to, uh, eh, maybe it's not important to give them that moment, but yeah, what happened? What happened? And dude, this is what I love yeah. about your style of coaching is this. It's like giving people the tools to bear themselves when you're not there because no one's there to save you when you're a hundred feet up, uh, and you're by yourself. And so like, what does a coach do? They make, they give you the ability to get better. They don't make you better. It's it's like yeah. it's still you. I think sometimes as athletes we just forget like why we even do the damn thing every day, you know? And like I think my job as a coach is just to remind you the power that you have and how you can use that power that you already have, right? And so sometimes I fuck it up actually. Like if if somebody falls and I'll like jump, I'll jump a little bit too quickly and I'll ask too many leading questions to like get the answer I want. But I I very much try and and my opinion this is just my opinion. You know, you can call me wrong, but my opinion is that the best, the best coaches are the ones who can get somebody to answer the questions for themselves and ask the questions for themselves. So if you can a- ask some questions to get them to ask themselves some questions, I think that's like the best way to coach. If any of you guys are listening and you guys are coaches, I think that's really the best practice to have and challenge yourself every time. Like, don't just do your job. Don't go to the session and being like, all right, I just got to answer that. Qu- yeah, I got to answer the question this person has. Like, no. Your job as a coach is to step in and try to make this person better, right? And like, and perform better and understand better so that when you're not there, they're going to be a better athlete. And what a better athlete is, is not someone who can just perform better things, is have that confidence and have that opinion every time they go in so that they can mold themselves to be better. If you coach somebody and they're instantly better, that's great. But what you want to see is three months from then that they are way better because they now they have a track, right? That's, that's my goal as a coach to be like, all right, good luck and come back to me. And now you, you know, a lot better. And this is the basis of my coaching. This is, this is really the core of like what my coaching is like. So I have a couple of points about asking why, and not just to ask why, but always improve on asking why you can always get better at asking why. And actually you just kind of mentioned this, like people, when they fall often say the thing that they think is the reason that they fell right? You'll see this all the time. Every single climber I've seen falls and they're like, oh, it was this. Oh, I slipped. Oh, my skin hurts. Oh, something happened. Like, I can't do that move. I can't step on this foot. It's like, how many of those opinions have been correct, right? Like how many times have you heard somebody say something where they fall and then they end up sending the move or sticking the move or sending the climb for a totally different reason, a totally external reason, right? Because often our feelings are what we use to justify or to, to explain the reason why we found something. I'm going to go back a point then because Josh is agreeing to this feeling thing. Drop feeling. It's going to be the first coaching point that I have for you. Drop feeling. Feeling isn't objective. It's not objective, right? We need, we and feelings are feelings. I don't think we should not have feelings. Of course, feelings happen, but drop feeling in terms of analysis, right? Feeling is not the core of our analysis. We need objectivity to make actual steps towards progression and reasoning to understand exactly what we're doing. We don't understand based of our feeling. We understand based off of objectivity and objectivity comes from understanding physics and biomechanics and you know what actually happens. So feeling will improve, right? That's another point. Feeling will also improve over time as you get better and stronger at things. And, and feeling is... 
here's another point I made about feeling. Feeling is a, is a really important tool in effort because it can make us adapt. It can make us have confidence, but you're often far away from the truth, far away from understanding true potential. So don't rely on feeling for the why you should do something or not. And basically my point there is we just don't know what's possible. We don't. Nobody knows what's really truly possible. I want yeah, I wanna I, I want I, I agree, but I, I want to tease out a little bit of this word feeling because I think that there's two things going on there. It, it's something that I've shared with you behind the scenes, is that something that's been really important for me talking to you is this getting rid of a feeling in the sense of, oh, like this hold feels bad. And it's like, well, yeah, it's a shitty crimp. And like, oh, like I feel out of shape. It's like so what? Like it, it's it's all these things, all this like self talk that seems reasonable, but doesn't really get us anywhere. And so I I hear that, but I also I don't want this to be conflated with with developing your intuition. Like it's like there mm -hmm. is and there, it is important to be objective, but sometimes you have these like sense. Okay, actually, I'm just gonna I'm gonna as we get deeper and deeper into the weeds, I want to bring it back to a example. And I want to go back to me on steep climb to kind of show you what I'm talking about with feeling. And, and maybe we can tear a little bit of this apart too. So I do the boulder problem and I get to what's the last move. And I'm there with my buddy Sander uh, and Sander shares his beta with me. And it was using this foot jam, this good foot jam to try to go to this last kind of good flake to kind of end the quote unquote crux and uh foot feels good i commit to the move and i can't reach and sander has this has this beta dialed and so i know that this is a, a possible way to do it and so i like try that move again and i commit to that foot and i say okay like am i really too short for this because usually i'm I, i'm not like super tall but reachy is fine with me. Like it's never things I, I don't get to use that complaint, but I could, I really couldn't make the move. So I, I like, I took a step back and I said like, okay, like Sander knows how to climb. I'm going to try this beta. I'm going to really commit to it. I couldn't reach it. So I start running through these options and I find some feet and, uh, they work and I, and I commit to the move and I do the move and then it starts raining. I got to leave and I'm rehearsing the boulder problem in my head and I'm thinking through this stuff and I'm thinking about that move. I'm like, geez, man, like this is a power endurance climb. I'm going to be at this boulder problem. Uh, this last move is hard for me. I don't have a good foot. I'm on these smeary feet. I, I'm going to be like, it's kind of, you have to skip a clip uh, or I have to skip a clip a little, a little off the, like, you know, a lot of pressure there. Uh, and I was realizing when I did that move and I, I, and I did it, right? I was like, oh, I can do this move. Like, I don't know, maybe like a V6 move, just do it, right? But when I really took a step back, I felt, and this is where I want to like not conflate like the feeling of, um, I don't know. I, I felt like how I did it wasn't really going to work on the go. I just had this intuition that I was like, this isn't going to work. And so as I thought back about what that move felt like and tried to take a step back and be a little more objective is I thought, man, I just, I'm not really putting weight on my feet. Like there are these kind of two smears, the holds are pretty good. And I just was kind of making it happen. And so when I did this kind of self-analysis, which the, the first step was being willing to rehearse this boulder problem in my head on the drive back, I'm like sitting there, like literally climbing it back in my head and thinking about, I can like see where the feet are. Okay. So I do this tick or this tick and I'm like, what can I do better? So this is one of the first tips, right? Is like, fucking do it like, or, uh, not, not fucking do the move, but do the self-analysis. Like, why was I rehearsing the boulder problem? It's like, cause I'm like, it's almost like putting in reps, uh, off the wall. And so I cared enough to like think back through it, but then somehow, you know, you start developing this, and this is where I want to use the word feeling that how I did it wasn't really going to work, uh, on the go. And so I took a step back and I thought about the move. And I realized that I was not putting enough weight on my feet. I just, I just can tell like deep down inside that I wasn't really digging into those feet. Uh, and that was going to be totally necessary. So, um, did I tease out that different idea of a feeling and I don't know, like, can we use this as an yeah, example no, I like to, it. to dive in? 
I like what you're saying because, you know, I, I wanted to be really concrete on this point of like drop feeling because I think the thing that always happens, and I'm so glad you brought this up because what you're talking about is the balance, right? The, the balance of like, well, feeling is going to be there. And like, but on the other side of feeling is objectivity, right? And so like, where do we lie? The problem is, is as humans, we just are feeling individuals. Like everything we consume or experience is going to be based off our feeling. Objectivity comes way, way, way after, you know, like you don't go to a brand new climber and explain things to them. Like they don't, they, they won't take those things right? Like most new climbers cannot take information. You're going to explain like, yeah, put your foot here, turn your body this way, fly here. And you're going to reach, right? Turn and reach. And they're like, Bleh. like, you know, it doesn't make sense to them. So it doesn't make any sense to like, you know, skip the steps. So my point is, is of course, feeling will always be there, you know? And that's the reason why we have to focus on this other side because feeling will always be there. And it's, I'm really glad that you brought up that balance because, you know, I think, the point that I make later is just the awareness of feeling, right? Like the feeling will always be there. So just be aware of it, use it, you know, don't, don't put it away necessarily, but because it's always there, we have to focus on not that deriving our choices, right? Our choices cannot be derived off of our feelings. Our, I mean, they will be, and that's the point is that because they will be, we have to focus elsewhere. It's like, our double minded, you know, double brain thinking, like our, our bodies have our own intuition and opinions, but you have choices to make. And you should make your choices from a place that is probably objective, because well, your feelings will always balance you. So I'm going to interrupt there, because I think what I what I really like hearing on this is, is you yeah, have this, there's almost like these two separate things, there's objective and subjective. But uh, I think what we talk about often is being able to take a step back, and that was more of an objective thing where I'm saying, like, I'm probably not putting enough weight on my feet. And by taking a step back, analyzing that, recognizing that, when I go back and start practicing putting more weight on my feet in this situation where it's like I'm a little scared, you know, I'm a, you know I've skipped a clip, uh, I'm really pumped. Uh, that's how you build that intuition and how you make that subjective experience closer to the objective ability, right? Where you, you take a step back, you analyze yourself, you realize what you're doing wrong, and then you integrate it. And the, the more often you do that, the better you are at kind of patching those holes in your ability. And then it just kind of comes out of you. So ideally, next time I'm in a situation like that, uh, I don't even have to really think. Uh, I, ideally, it just kind of comes out of me and I say either or, I mean, maybe there's a multi-step thing. Ideally, it just kind of comes out of me without even thinking I just intuitively put more weight on my feet or I recognize, hey, I'm a little stressed out here. I'm going to put more weight on my feet consciously. And then the the last uh, step is that, no, I just fell a bunch of times. What's going on here? Oh, I'm not putting weight on my feet. And you know, it's kind of like a multi-tiered thing, but really you want to develop that ability to take a step back and be objective like you're saying. And then- through practice and integration, develop intuition that's kind of subconscious where you're not thinking, it just kind of comes out of yeah. you. Yeah. And here's a final point for me about, about this is that I just think that most people in my experience are unable to get to that level of analysis, like you just explained, where you know your whole process of like, well, this is what I felt and this is this is what now tells me what's possible and not. That is the ideal, right? But most people have this constant thing where it's I, sh I shouldn't do this because it feels like I can't do this move this way. It's like, but where is that coming from, right? Because you're able to say that, Josh, because you're able to say, you, you know what's possible off of foot sequences. You know what's possible in terms of reach. You're pretty damn close to like what's actually possible, especially if you test it out and try it, right? That's the point is like, well, but at least you're going to test out and try it. Like you have the right approach, but often people won't even test out and try because they don't even feel like those things are possible. So once you have tried and then you say, well, I guess, I guess now I know what's possible, then that's where we should have formed our thought from in the first place. Not so much like, I think I can pull off this hold and step on this foot and then reach this move, or I think I can't. Those things don't matter at all. You kind of know what, you know, you have to find out what's possible, then use that and then, you know, direct your, direct your body. And often, often our feelings are probably more towards the negative, probably more towards this pessimistic, like, you, you can't do this as much as you think often, right? If we're pushing ourselves to our limit, it's more likely that you'll, you're going to experience your body telling you, I probably can't do this. And that's really my point is challenge that, right? Don't listen to it, but challenge it. Use that to say, but what can I do? Right. And that goes to our questions of why, right? What can I do and why, right? Like, 
because that's what you're getting good at answering in that position in, in that sequence, which is what your whole climbing experience usually is, is like, well, I could do this because of this, right? That because if you're really good at answering that because statement, like I can do this because this happens and then this happens, right? Like you just know, right? But people aren't that good at answering that over, you know, that that's just not something that people use all of the time. And that's something we have to develop is that, you know, that whole process of like, oh, I encounter this move and I feel this and then I have to ask this question and then I answer it. So we're, you know, in this analysis, we're doing about self-analysis. We're kind of talking about uh, something somewhat internal and hopefully being able to utilize friends to give us feedback. But I think one of the the biggest tools that now is available is video analysis. Vid sell, you know, well, not just analysis of your own video. Sometimes you can compare it to, to other people. And I just wanted to to bring that up as, as a, as a tool. And I was kind of wondering if you can go through some, some ways that we can use video analysis, uh, to not just, I guess, to, to fundamentally answer that question, what happened? Like, I think it video often gives you a, a clue. I, I I've said this a bunch of times where it blows me away where someone says, Oh, my hand blew. And I see, I'm watching, I see their foot blow. And then of course their hand blew because their foot blew. And I just am so surprised how many times people are literally wrong and, and myself included, but hopefully not too often. And so, yeah, you know, with this idea in mind of, of trying to uh, self-analyze, how do you use, or how do you recommend people use video uh, to their benefit? Such a good, such a good point, such good questions. And like, you know, you also kind of answered it right there by talking about the process of like, oh, my hand blew, but then like my foot blew and that's what made my hand blow. That's a really hard place to get to, you know, and that just takes a lot of like true digging and like not being so quick to know the answer, I think. And like really, and I think what's, this has actually been really hard for me is like teaching people how to coach themselves because I'll get them to ask that question, right? Like, okay, well, we'll try a move in the fall and I'll say, okay, what what is the most controlling point here what's the anchor hold what's the deriving force of this move what are you even trying to accomplish right like these are the questions you have to ask when it comes to self analysis right and the first question probably is what are you trying to accomplish and what do you have available for you for you to accomplish that right okay i'm trying to do this big lock off move and i have this foot it's like okay but like are you trying to get height are you trying to maintain tension are you trying to get across your body like you know are you what are you trying to do like if you understand what you're trying to accomplish more then you understand what you're actually using and then you have to look at what do you have available right and then based on what you have available then you just go through the points right and then when it comes to like performance failure like slipping or like you know hands dry firing or like hands you know, what I see in climbing movements all the time is biasing. So like, you know, you're doing a big, a big move. And instead of going to the hold, your hips stay behind because your anchor arm, the arm that's pulling will like pull in and not let it go. Right. And you, you know, Josh has mentioned something like this before where like people don't get height because they don't extend their lower arm. It's more so like, you don't understand what you're actually trying to accomplish. So in the feeling that you're trying to get again, back to feeling is getting controlling the wall for some reason. A lot of people are like, oh, I want to just pull into the wall. It's like, that's not what you're trying to do though. You're trying to get to the next hold, right? So if that's the important part of, if that's a priority, pick the priority for what you're trying to get your body to do. And then we go to the analysis, right? The analysis of what happened. So, because if we go straight to what happened first, we have nothing to base off of like why the failure means anything, right? The failure has to mean something. So I, uh, what it makes me think of is in a really concrete term where I see that breaking down is a lot of times people, when they look at video, because I want to like dive into this video uh, analysis because it's a really useful useful tool, is people will look at the hand that's going to the next hold and say, it wasn't that close, right? It's like, like it's always focused on that particular thing. And that's kind of analogous to what you're saying where people are focusing on that hold, but then they're not taking that next step and looking at all of the factors that go into doing that move. And one of my favorites often is people say they're standing up and straightening their leg, but they're not. And uh, you just alluded to the kind of like, maybe like the the next level version of that is people often think that <laughs> it's like, it's very hard for people to let their arm go past their lower arm, the arm that, yeah, the anchor arm go past 90 degrees open 
uh, when they're going to a move. It's amazing how hard that is for people. And so I guess what I'm hearing- Well, by the way, that's that's because you're accustomed to this thought that if you try to do a movement, this is the way, like your your brain grows accustomed to methods, right? And like, oh, of course, on these other climbs, you're successful doing this every time, but does that mean that's the best way to create? It's like, what are you trying to create? Momentum, drive, like mm-hmm. static force, tension? Like, what are you trying to create? Because if you're trying to create something specific, you cannot create it the same way every time, right? Because we are accustomed to feeling successful in this way, we just we just associate that to that's how we do moves. And then people go to the moon board and get shut down. They're like, I can't reach this. It's like, well, how are you creating in the first place, right? And the moon board taught me a lot of that. It's like, how can you create? Not so much how should you create, but how can you create? And then I started to, you know, bring that to other movements. And then I was like, wow, I can create in a million different ways. So what's tricky and what I'm trying to do here is I hear what you're saying and I want to showcase it in an actual physical way. And uh, I'm trying to link what you're saying into the things we see in video. And this is where you're saying it. it's like, how do I create that movement? And you can start looking at limbs or hips and you can say like, uh, you know, so instead of looking at the hand that's going to a hold and saying like, I'm six inches away, like, what do I do? Like pull harder. Like, what does that mean? It's like, okay. Uh, you know, what, what are the basics? It's like, okay, instead of looking at the hand that, and how close it got to the hold you're going to, let's look at where your hips are. Let's look at, uh, are you straightening your legs? Are you straightening your arms? If it's a big move, if you're trying to rock onto foot and go over, you know, get, you know, maybe you're generating, movement off of a high foothold. Okay. Are you getting weight on that foothold? What does that mean? Are you getting your knees over your toes in there? And then before that, are you pushing off of the lower foot to get the dynamic movement onto that foot? Are when you see a side pull, it's like, look at your hips and the angle of your body. Are you making that side pull? Uh, are you taking that side pull to the most advantageous way it can be taken by twisting? And, uh, you know, I guess, my my point is is I want to try to take what you're saying and make it concrete in terms of people's ability to analyze themselves on a video. And I think that it's that first step is going from like how close are you to the hold? It's like that's not the helpful place to look, right? Like it's everything else. Uh and understanding like what you're saying, like how do I generate movement? Like, um, and so, yeah, that, that's where I'm trying to like narrow us into no, I, that stuff. It's I difficult. love this. And it's hard to explain. It's super difficult. And I actually don't think we're going to get there. I'll, I'll just say that right now. I, I don't think we're going to get there. And that's the point. The point is, is that this is the fun part about climbing, right? Like climbing wouldn't be fun if you can get a coach or an instruction sheet to like get you up every boulder or every route. It, that's based off of your opinions on like what's possible. And it's based on your level of strength and your ability to perform. Right. But at the core of it, you just want to understand a little bit more about all of them. And that's why I always explain climbing in the extreme balance between, you know, sorry, the balance between these two extremes is shitting on easy climbs and learning new possible movements. Right. My point here is, is if like you're only you're only obviously capped in terms of your performance at what movements, you know, so you do have to develop what movements you possibly know. And exactly what you're saying you know, open your scope, right? That's, that's really the point here is open your scope. If you want to get to the next hold, think about why and how it can happen. There is no necessarily right answer all the time. What we're looking for is this word optimal. I always use this word optimal in in coaching. And the the idea there is that, you know, 30, 50 years down the line is going to be a robot who could probably do every climbing movement optimally for their size, for their weight, for their level of friction on their skin, but they're going to be able to tell you this is the best way. And our goal as rock climbers is to learn that and try that and find it for ourselves and be able to perform optimal all of the time, right? That's my goal. <laughs> I think that's what a lot of people's goals are in rock climbing. So the, the key there is what is optimal? And it's like, that's a good question. That's a really And that's the good question, question that everybody <laughs> should ask is what is optimal? And everybody's answer is going to be different. I am not the coach who can tell you you know, and people who work with me will know this, like, I'm not there to sit and tell you how to do optimal. I'm sitting there telling you how to find Find. optimal, right? And then once you find optimal, you know, and first of all, defining that it is actually optimal because then, you know, I can tell people all the time, like, I can even tell you, I think this is the optimal way. Josh, like, I think this is the optimal beta and it could be right and it could be wrong, right? But all I'm going to pick on you for is, but are you committing towards that? Like, do you even believe that? And why don't you believe that, right? And what what do you believe? And what are you committing for? What are you thinking about, right? Because, you know, we're so disconnected from that. We're so, every rock climber in every session 
not every, but like most rock climbers and most sessions and including myself, we look at optimal and then our ability to actually perform that is quite far, right? Like when we pull onto the wall, we're like, yeah, for sure. I'm going to stick this one, put my foot there and go for this because you have an assumption. You have a logical, rational assumption that that's the best beta and you pull on and sometimes it is and you still don't perform it right? Because you have feelings and reactions on the wall and you have adaptations. But like, how often do you go back to the first beta and you're like, damn it, that was the one. I should have just done this more. I should have just believed in it more. You know what I'm saying? Like that, but that happens far more often than you think in so many different ways. And so people should always ask, and that goes going back to your question, you know, like what, but how do you actually define, like, what are you, what steps are you looking towards? It's just asking your question, like what, what is optimal in, in my opinion? And just defining that, because again, going back to that a point we talked about earlier, it's better to have an opinion and be wrong and you're going to be wrong, but it's much better to go that way than just to listen, respond, consume to everything and then not have an opinion about it because then you're never going to make that choice. So the key here is look for that opinion, form that opinion, go for it hundred percent, regardless if you're wrong or not, because you probably are going to be wrong. And then you ask questions afterward to yourself, to the video, to other people. And then you make just a different try. You, you try again, you, you go, you know, you go towards that. Is that, is that something that is that does that answer suffice a little oh, bit more? Love it, dude. Yeah. Um, you know what kind of makes me think of is when Carlo talked about how he would do boulder problems again and again and again, mm -hmm. and he would have them dialed, and then he would come up with some entirely different method for doing it and start the process all over again. And just that that commitment and that learning and that idea of what is optimal. And think, God, how many times do you also hear people say? wow, it was easy once it went, you know, like that was easy. And it's amazing what just little subtle differences. Uh, it, and it actually, I, the other uh, example that came to mind when I was thinking about video analysis was I did this, um, let me see, I have it written down here. I did this V11 called Believing on the 2019 Moonboard set. And it has this like weird kind of like, arm pogo almost move like you it's kind so of traverse hard over so took me a while uh so what was weird is i yeah i tried it or whatever and then you know clearly there's kind of like this crux move like this kind of one arm jump right so i pull on right there and i do the move and i was like okay and then i'm like oh well i i think i literally did the after i failed to flash the climb i think i quote unquote flash that crux move my first try. So I'm like, I'm just going to go start from the beginning. I'm just going to do it right now. And I just proceeded to fall on that move over and over and over again. And I was just like, what is different on the go? And I looked at the video and it was like really hard for me to tell what I was doing wrong. But I finally figured out that I was, instead of uh, doing the move, staying close to the wall and jumping, when I did it from the ground or from you know the, the midway, I had sagged out and I had really focused on the arm pogo. And it was just so interesting how I could do the move easily from right there. And then I couldn't quite put it together. And honestly, when I was looking at the video, it didn't jump out at me right away because it's subtle. It's not like, it's like, oh, like you put your foot in the wrong place. Or like, it was like, I sagged my hips out a touch and then my arm actually came down. And I actually did use the momentum versus just kind of not doing that. And it just goes to show you it's, it's, I, I don't know. It's, it's just, I found that so illuminating and it really tested my self-analysis skills because I was struggling to feel it on the wall. What was going wrong? I was like, am I just trying harder? And then when I finally did it, it was, it, it, it was easy or it was I'm gonna, quote unquote easy. Yeah. Yeah. And I love, I love this whole like process that you just explained because it's very common for like high level climbing and like high level climbers, but here's like how I would have coached you through it. Cool. So that the start of that climb is like relatively straightforward, right? Uh, you cross under over to that crimp and then you like drop down and you're in a new setup, right? So I'm not going to explain like how to get there because it's for you relatively straightforward and it's like mostly body tension related and like positioning. And it's mostly size related to be honest for that move. So everyone would do that a little bit differently. That's a pretty straightforward move though. You pull on, you create tension. This next move is really not straightforward. Why? Because it, it is ambiguous on how to create. So my question for you right then would have been, so you're falling probably distance related, right? You probably weren't getting height on this hold. A, a little right? bit. So, yeah, probably height because I would touch it, but I, I wasn't in, engaged on it. And I was swinging right. kind of off. Yeah, but go ahead. Sorry. Right. And and your analysis could go towards like, I feel like I can't pull on this crimp. I feel like the feet are too far. Like you can start saying those things. That's already the wrong path, in my opinion, an inefficient path to getting to your answer. The path should have been 
what could you not do, right? And what what could you not do in your first when your first tries? Oh, you're asking me. I'm, I'm just uh, asking you. I yeah. do, wait. When you say what could I not do, do you mean like what was not available to me, or how did no I no fail? like what what ex- what actually did your body do that was that was not success? Success would be getting into this hold. All right, that's maybe the better way to do it. What is success in this movement? Sticking Ob- it obviously. without um yeah, sticking it uh solidly and and where where I was failing was I would get there, but yeah, I was, I was short on it. Or when I kind of would latch mm. it, I just felt like I was swinging a lot. Uh, yeah. It, it felt like that. Cause that's actually more, that's actually more specific, but let's just say you weren't getting to the hold yet. Cause that's probably where most people will, you mm. know, uh, relate to the moon board is I couldn't get to the hold yet. So the only question you have to ask is how do I get more distance? Right. And there's so many ways you can create more distance, but in your case, you found that the most significant way, because the other ways were too hard, right? And that's the biggest thing is that that movement is just limiting, right? Like I've, I've done that climb and like the, the biggest thing is that the feet don't do very much for you, right? So that because the feet already don't do much for you, you have to be more creative about how to use your feet, which is probably through momentum. So for me, a big thing was swinging with my hips and then following with my arm. I also did the arm pogo and the arm pogo just led me to create the most out of the other ways that I also created, created distance. And for me, it was driving off my feet. How do I drive off my feet better? Okay. I create momentum. How do I create momentum better? I swing this way and then I use my arm. Right. And that way I answered the first question, which was distance. And I'm going to answer your second question, which was sustaining tension throughout the, throughout, I almost answered your, I almost answered the question I was about to ask you was sustaining tension throughout height, right? Once you stick a hold, you have to maintain tension. And what's the point of contact that maintains that tension? What's the, it's the left hand really. Or what are the two? But yeah, both hands. What are the two? Both hands. And I think that's the key. That's the key that most people confuse is it's the left hand, right? When I stick it, that's Mm -hmm. what maintains my tension. No, it's not. It's the right hand. It's the anchor hold, right? If you thought about maintaining this right hand pull throughout the movement and did that, you would create more tension, right? It's not so much about sticking this and then creating the tension. It's also about sustaining, following through with the thing you're already doing. That's the thing that I think most people don't realize is that, okay, I've told my body to fire this move. And then you forget that your body doesn't sustain that mechanic throughout the whole, the entirety of it. So you have to, you have to, when you're going through a video, you have to understand what did I ask my body to do? And did I do that for the amount of time that was required? right? That's, that's what you should be looking at in your video. Mm -hmm. And how do you ask the questions is what did I need though? Right. And so for you, what did I need? I needed height. And then I needed to maintain tension. So there's two, there's two questions and then there's two answers. So I, I, I literally like how you took me through that was literally what I did. And then here's the thing why it occurred to me is because it actually was one more layer where, uh, I, so I just want to point out, I'm exactly on board with what you said. And that was exactly the process I went through. And then I still wasn't doing it. And this is why it stuck out, stuck out in my head is because I felt like I, uh, I felt like I was doing the right thing. I was, you know, exactly what you're saying where it's like, okay, like I'm struggling to get height. Okay. Like, how do I do that? Uh, you know, I need to push more with my feet. Um, and then, oh, I'm struggling to stick this. And it's like, make sure that you're engaging with your lower hand, uh, you know, be accurate. And I was still, uh, struggling. And what came through on it, uh, is that I was getting the height by my feet and what that was causing me to do was stay in close to the wall. So it's like, how do you get height? It's like, keep your hips in close uh, and jump, right? Like, so your, uh, you know, your angle is as close to the wall, but then that was causing me to swing more. And so I was losing and, but, you know, but my first thought was make sure that you're engaging with that right hand and hold that swing. But then I uh, was struggling and I was, you know, latching it, but coming off. And that's where I had to go to the video and say like, what I'm doing is was wrong or it's not, it, it was not optimal for me. It wasn't working. <laughs> and, and so what I saw was this, this movement where I, when I did do it is I was sagged out and I got that extra bit of height instead of pushing with my feet and staying close to the wall and swinging off. I was letting my body come away from the wall, getting what I needed from both my feet and my arm. Now I could get the height, uh, without, uh, going close to the wall and taking that, that ride and, then putting that all together. So getting the height, holding on with my right hand, but then finding that a ba- a w- uh, that that way of getting the height without use, having to take that big swing. And so I, I just thought it was a good example because I went through what you were saying, but then that video really helped me to say like, I'm doing it right. What the hell's going wrong? Why don't, why can't I stick it? And it showed me this subtle little difference that 
Uh, it still took me some tries to to put it into action, um, but I thought that was kind of fun. Yeah, no, I love I love what you're saying, and and you know here's the the last kind of like piece of analysis. There was the swing, and uh, my opinion on swings is exactly what you're saying, where it's kind of the relationship between getting there and then dealing with it. So you might want to adjust how you get there, right? Because sometimes you do want to stay close to the wall, but sometimes you want to land at the hold, right? Sometimes you want to land at the hold so that the impact of the swing is mitigated already, right? If you land, it's like plumb line in uh, like okay when you clip when you clip a draw and you like. Walk, you know, you grab a hole and you walk your feet somewhere, you walk your feet somewhere on purpose. So your body doesn't sway. And that's called the plumb line. You're finding the plumb line and that mitigates, that mitigates the swing. Right. And that's exactly what happens in jumps. You want to jump at the position so that you mitigate the swing. If you cannot jump at the position because you need to create a lot of drive in this case, you know, you, the, the drive created was more important than the impact. So you have to deal with the impact a different way. Well, your opinion and how to, you know, mitigate the swing was to pull in with the right arm more. My opinion in to mitigate the swing there is to pull in the body more, get the chest and the forehead forward and let the lower body flare. Mm. That's been kind of proven in terms of like physics by Akio and Yanya that that's the better way to release swing and to let swings happen is to stick a move, tuck in and let the lower body flare. And so if you get close to the wall, you should let that happen. And I'm curious, yeah, you should try that next time. If you end up doing a dynamic move where you cannot land at the ending position mm. and this this will be so deep i'm sure a lot of you guys are like what the hell is tim talking about i'm not going to go deep into, into this um because this is this is just this is just too much but you know for for josh's sake uh because it's, i think this helps explain it if you know the ending position being not the important you know priority in terms of the mechanic that you're focusing on for you you're focusing on the drive so you get close how do you deal with that there's a million ways to, you know, I'm going to learn five years from now, a year from now, a different way to mitigate that swing, right? But that's the point is what is the best way to mitigate that swing? And you had one opinion about pulling in with your right arm, but there's a lot of other opinions and we can just look for those, right? And it's not for me to say like you picked the wrong way. It's just like, we should look for all of the ways, right? And that will help us do movements. Well, I mean, for me, the reason why I brought this up is because it's about what tools are available for you to keep on peeling back the onion of why did yeah. I fall and then answering it. And, uh, you know, I don't want to bring up this whole like optimal versus, uh, suboptimal for, for myself at that time. Just the, the point was, is that I had, I had the toolkit. I said, I'm, I'm going to generate this way. I'm going to try to hold on this way. And I, I got stuck. Uh, you know, I, I wasn't, I wasn't sending. And so, it's like, what, what, what's the next thing to do? And that self-analysis is I'm, yeah. I'm, I was by myself. I'm in the barn barn, <laughs> you know, uh, what, what's the, what's the, what do I have available to, to my, uh, to help me succeed? I had my video camera and boy, did I dive in deep on that. And, uh, you know, that's not the only way to self-analyze as I talked about with my experience on that, uh, steep climb named desire. Uh, but I just wanted to really get to the heart of an example of how to use tools and how to introspect to solve a problem. And I just thought it was a really good example because it, it's this thing where we all have kind of like some first line of defenses. It's like, find the right foot. And you go, okay, I found the right foot. It's like, okay, like, you know, crimp hard. Okay. I crimped like, but what now? And, and the thing is, is like, had that not worked for me on believing uh, I would have had to go another step forward. And I just think that's kind of the, the fun part. And that, that's what happens in hard climbing is you just keep, you keep trying something and committing to it, like we talked about, and then you get stumped and you're like, what's next? And, and I think this is just to echo something that Jamie talked about with uh, those great climbers is they always had a way to figure out somehow, okay, what am I trying next? And that's, that's yeah. kind of what we're going into right now is what's next. Yeah. The creative, yeah. the creative process for the cause and effect, right. Understanding, all right, this is the cause and this is the effect. And then how do I answer this better? Right. Like every time I witness something in my movement, you know, and the, yeah, obviously video helps there. It's like, all right, I'm going to jump to this hole. Just go, okay. I got to the hole, but now I'm like swinging all rapidly. And like, you know, I'm my, my, my hip trajectory in the air was like this and that meant this and I have to then do this. And there's so many things you can look at in terms of that cause and effect. And yeah, I agree. I think the best climbers in the world are the ones who can answer that cause and effect really, really well, really quickly too, and have actually strong proven opinions on that, right? We can always have opinions like, oh, bro, like you should do that this way. Everyone knows the Boulder bros who go in, you should do that this way. You should spray. And it's like, or they spray and they're like, you should do it this way. It's like, what is that based off of? Right. Like, because it could be right, but like, 
what is that based off of? That's not going to help anybody, right? Like you should explain like, oh, I think what I notice is that when you do this, there's way too much speed here. And that's coming because your right hand isn't doing enough of a job when you get to this height. It's like, wow, what an in-depth anal analysis. And now this person can go up and control the right hand more, right? It's like, oh, you're you're getting to the hold, but your hips are like so underneath you. You're hitting this arm straight. And that looks really hard for you to like, you know, swing off on. It's like, that's much better spray to have also, you know, like that. that's the type of spray we want to have is like, well, this is what I noticed. And this is the cause and effect. That's a deeper cause and effect than like, going back to, you know, what we said earlier is like, you didn't try hard enough, right? Like, that's why that is not super helpful because like, that's not something that we can, well, it, it might be something that has an effect, but better to look deeper at the, at the actual cause and effect. Yeah. Um, I had, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, I, uh, you know, when I just was looking at kind of more of my notes around, you know, pragmatic or practical ways to, to do this stuff. And it, it's funny because one of my things was like asking your friends what they saw and sometimes they aren't good, uh, but there is an element of oftentimes when you say something or when someone says something to you in that cause and effect way, you, and you, and it's a good thing, it hits home. You go like, ah, oh, you're right. It does feel like I can't get my hips there. I, oh, like it, oftentimes when you hear something from someone and it just kind of you feel it. You're like, Ooh, dude, that is, that's the thing. Uh, you know, lean into that. Um, but yeah, don't, don't listen to all beta. I will say that, um, sometimes people <laughs> yell at you things and you just think to yourself, no, no. Well, um, cause they have their opinions too. Right. And they have their own way of going through cause and effect and you should navigate that yourself. I had one, um, kind of more practical approach as well. That was somewhat similar to the, like the straight up video analysis side, which by the way, at the end of all of this is probably the best thing to do is that was my pro tip for the last podcast or the previous podcast was get a tripod and start filming yourself. It's going to be the best thing to do. Um, and, uh, my, my thing was get better at paying attention, uh, know what your body parts are doing more often to grow your awareness it might be hard at first and it might disrupt performance in that moment. It actually probably will disrupt performance in that moment because you're thinking about it, but it's, it'll get easier and it's a long-term investment. This is something that, you know, a lot of strong climbers probably don't even realize because it's so intuitive at that moment is that they just kind of know what is happening. You'll see it in stronger climbers are able to explain their sequence right after they fall a lot better than most climbers can pay attention to hold colors, how easy or hard they are to use and why, what direction they're facing, why that's relevant, what the mood of the movements are. Is it aggressive, static, painful, awkward? Like these are the things that for me, help me remember what's my, what my body is doing on the wall. Therefore I can say what was a failing point and what was helpful for me. Like, I really like that. I turned my knee this way because that did this, right? I really don't like how, you know, this position felt because it didn't help me with this, right? Like the, and based on this left foot that's facing this way, I think that because it's facing this way, I can't create this much off of this. And that's what I need. And then Danny goes, you don't need to create bro. Like you just got to create this tension. I'm like, oh shit. Like, okay. I, then that foot's totally fine. Right. If we can, if we can improve that awareness of understanding what our bodies are actually doing on the wall and how we are interacting with the mechanics that we're using, with the footholds that we're stepping on, with the handles that we're grabbing and the handles that we're jumping to, or, you know, latching, then over time we can analyze a little bit better when we come off the wall. I can't just tell you how many times I've run into people who are like, you know, they fall and I'm like, all right, what happened? And I know exactly what happened because I'm watching, right? And that's what I'm paying attention to. And people were like, oh, no idea. Like, I'm like, well, what are we sitting here for then? Like, what are we, what are we trying to improve someone, on, right? Why'd you put your foot there? And it's like, I don't know. <laughs> you're like, why? like, oh, I put my foot there. I get yeah, that one a lot. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. Uh, one thing I had written that, that really links in uh, to that is, is something that we've kind of talked about is just ask yourself why you fell each time. And I, I, I am making that explicit because I think it's important, but uh, I, I think me and Tim are almost imagining that it's, and of course, like, of, of course you want to know why you fell each time. But I definitely understand every time I fell what happened. Um, and I may be somewhat wrong. And, you know, when you're really diving in deep and you corroborate with video or with your friends, but it's just that practice of, why did I fall? Uh, and, and I think this is why you can do things like really dangerous highballing too, because you kind of, you know, when things are fine and safe and you know uh, what you're trying to do on this move. And yes, that doesn't mean your foot can't pick or you can't miss the hold or, you know, whatever the case may be that causes you to fall, but you understand the move and what you're looking to do and what could go wrong. And when something does go wrong, well, now, you know, 
ideally now you know why it went wrong and what to do next. Yeah, hindsight. That. Hindsight became 2020 at that point. Yeah. Mm, yeah. I definitely get that asked. Um, I got asked that at the the movie premiere, actually. How many times did you send or like how many times did you rehearse Too Big to Flail for the first time you did it? And I said, uh, I sent it on my third session and then I did it two more times that day. And then I went for it the next session. And people were like, dude, that is just not enough. I'm like, totally was enough for me, man. Like I understood exactly where I was going to fall and why and how to prevent that from happening. And if external factors came and I had to, you know, encounter a new one, which they always do, right, then I'm more comfortable now because I'm just more aware of the points. And, and if I'm not, then I'll fall. I don't have any control if I fall or not necessarily, but I have control over the factors that I understand. And I chose to make those factors that I understood justified for me to go for it <laughs> and Don't risk my you, life. Or... I, I'm guessing you probably know all the beta on that climb right now, six months later. Um, yeah, of since course. Last, you know, dude, I, I'm just going to rip on my buddy Pete. Um, and I was climbing with him a few days ago in the gym and there was this climb that he's been on a few times and he uh, struggled at the crux um, and he came down and I was like, uh, actually, I should say, I should be a little more specific. He got to the crux and they moved his feet all around like he didn't know what to do. And uh, my critique for him after he fell is uh, he got back on, did the move. He was like, oh, that was an easy move. And I was like, first of all, just if you know what to do, don't dick around. Don't just put your feet all around, like commit to it. Just like you were saying, like have an opinion, go for it. Uh, and then he said, yeah, but I didn't really know what to do. And I was like, Pete, you've been on this climb like four times. Like, uh, he was like, really? And I said, how do I know that you've been on this climb more often than you have? And I, I think it's, I'm, I'm just uh, picking on Pete, but I think it's really an important uh, underground thing of what we're talking about with self-analysis, paying attention, being present, uh, you know, not being so focused on, you know, that top finishing jug, but every move you're doing, why you're doing each move. And uh, I don't know, I, I'm... I feel like we we went pretty good and deep on on, on this one. Um, yeah, I, I but you what have... you just said that go ahead, yeah, yeah. That last sentence that's that's the core of all of it, right? Just pay attention, right? Like, get good at asking why I fell. Get good at asking, you know, what I should do and what I have available, and answering those questions. And, and... I, I just sorry, I'm interrupted because it's like yes, but what we're doing here is then you get to some answer and then you. And then you ask why again, because you failed. It's like, okay, I failed because uh, I was pumped. It's like, okay. Uh, or my, my hand blew. Okay. Why did your hand blow? Okay. What are you going to do next time? Okay. You did that next time. Uh, why did you fall this time? And it's just like, it's a never ending process. So, uh, you know, hopefully we're setting up these, th these tools and these ways to show you how to keep on going down that journey. And the thing is, is that and the only way it ends is you did the problem or you did the route and then you go on to the next one and now you failed because we, all we do is freaking fall. But why did you fall, Tim? And what are you going to do next time yeah. different? Yeah. And my, my final point after all of this being said is, you know, this is going back to kind of what I said earlier about, you know, me putting a lot of effort off the wall. This is the, for me, the effort off the wall. And when I, if I can put a lot of effort in, in this way off the wall, what I can do is when I get on the wall, it's just add aggression. This is something that you hear in my coaching a lot of the time is like, let's spend all this time to analyze and learn and develop and grow opinions and be creative and ask the questions. And then when you pull on, I always tell this to my clients, like, before you go though, just be aggressive, like get, get what you're trying to get, you know, like, and that's for me saying better to have an opinion and be wrong and just go for it than to just listen and respond and not have an opinion in, in the end of it. So have opinions, be aggressive, go for those opinions. And if you're wrong, ask why. Yeah. Off the wall. Right. And that's this self-analysis. This is, you know, something that you would podcast and, and pontificate on deeply about. Um, it's not just about getting aggro and, and pulling hard. It's, it's uh, how to keep on leveling up, achieve that uh, black belt in mastery there, Tim. Yes. <laughs> All right. Do we got hopefully you guys else? got there with us? <laughs> no, that was that was a hard one <laughs> to talk about. But hopefully, you guys got something out of it. Um, Super yeah, important, no, though. I'm, Jesus, I'm just like the 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 skill that you gotta develop all along the way. Um, and I I also think that there's all these hints uh, that can help you. There's what do you like? What don't you like? What would your friends say you're good at? Um, what is the thing that 
you know, what was my pro tip that when you do it gets you better at everything else. Like these are all things that will kind of hone your understanding of, of self-analysis and how to determine what's optimal for you. Uh, and they just kind of give you these kind of boundaries, these kind of like constraints when you start, uh, you know, uh, you still need to be creative and ask why, uh, uh, but those are, those are hints along the way that, that help you guide your, your understanding. So, um, uh, that's okay, it I say me. one more. Oh one yeah. More yeah. Point. Okay. One more point. One more point. I think the reason why this is really like, uh, important for me and was always important for me since like my first year climbing was because I was really curious at what point I actually needed to train. And that for me was really hard to prove until I could analyze my climbing to a point where I actually could say out loud to myself or inside and say, okay, I'm doing this the best possible way for my body and I still can't do the move. So now I have to go train. And I think that's a really key point for a lot of people to take away is like, when should I start training and what should I train? Well, this is how you find that out. Try moves, have opinions, ask why. And if you still can't do it at the end of it and you have amazing analysis, and you sent me your video and I'm like, yeah, that was great. And you're still too weak to do the move. That's when you train. That's the answer that we all want in our climbing is, all right, well, I'm doing this the best possible. I've tried a thousand times and I still can't do it, but I'm really close. Like, well, what now? And this is how you ask also, why, what in your body do you not possess? What are you not strong enough to actually do? And that's what you should train. You should not man, I can't reiterate this enough. Don't buy a plan if you don't know what the plan is. If you know the plan, you read the plan, you're like, wow, this does relate to everything that I suck at. Maybe that's a good plan for you. But most of the time, it's not going to be the case. It's not going to be that catered to you. That's the amazing point of rock climbing for me is like, you know, that Dave Graham discussion where you guys are talking about, you know, you brought this up in two different lights where it's like, yeah, he's not a strong climber. And you're like, but he is a really strong climber. And Jamie said, like, why he's a strong climber. It's like, great. So he, use, he utilizes that based off of his opinions on why he can or cannot do movements. So everyone should go do that. Go try the climbs, ask the questions why, and then that's what will tell you what and how to train. Yeah, here's a here's a hint. Uh, Dave Graham didn't become Dave Graham by bench pressing more. Um, just, <laughs> just full stop. Um, all like, right, really? No, yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah, really. Um, all right, you guys, uh, if you like this one, um, go join Patreon and you could uh, – pick our brains deeper on like, I think it'd be fun to go deeper on something like video analysis uh, on this one. I mean, it's such a, it's such a great tool. Um, and I, I know people are going to have questions specifically about how to analyze themselves. Um, you know, specific moves, especially if it's like a famous boulder problem or something that we all want to do, um, you know, share your video with us, uh, and we can cover it on an AMA, um, when we go deep. So, Look out for uh, yeah, tear it up. Yeah, tell me why I'm wrong. Yeah, <laughs> leave us a voicemail. Um, sign up for our newsletter <laughs> uh, and join our Patreon so we can go, so we can do this kind of podcasting, but with you there in front of us, uh, asking us questions, so we can go deeper where you want to go deeper. That's it, Tim. Au revoir. See you guys next week. Next week. <laughs>Thanks for tuning in. If you'd like to learn more about Test Piece Climbing, you can check us out at testpiececlimbing.com and even book a session with one of our coaches.